Dear ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Webit X 2019. Please warmly welcome our wonderful hosts, Boriana Gramatikova and Darin Majarov. Ladies and gentlemen, artificial intelligences, we are pleased to welcome you to the second edition of WebEdX. <laughs> My name is Boriana Gramatikova, and I will be 50% of your hosting duo for tonight. Good evening from me as well. I'm the other half. My name is Darin, and I'm the co-founder of the largest educational platform in Bulgaria. It is called Uchase. We have helped already more than 600,000 students learn faster, and some of them have already achieved their dreams. That is why I joined WebEx as the most inspiring event for the thousands of young people, the thousands of students that are here with us tonight. This is a historic event. WebEx is the biggest platform in the world for inspiring the young, talented people of a single nation. True, and I honestly cannot see a better moment to open this wonderful event, which will also include the annual Webit Awards, the ultimate benchmark of true mastery in digital transformation of businesses and society. Tonight we'll shed light on the big ideas that are changing the world as we speak and meet you with the visionaries behind them. One of those visionaries is born here in Bulgaria and is responsible for this event. Please welcome on the stage the founder and executive chairman of Webit Foundation, Dr. Dr. Plamen Rusev! <laughs> Okay. Dobar večer. Dobar večer. <laughs> kak ste? Kak ste, kak ste? Dajte da napravim teka, ako ste dobre, kazvate da. Dobre li ste? Da. Da, da opitame pak. Dobre li ste? Da. Jaz vi običam. I zato ste tuka, zašto ste odlišnicite na Bulgarije. <laughs> Сега, преди да поканя нашият не много скъп гост, той е много скъп гост, но той не е гост, защото той е наш партньор в това престъпление да събереме най-умните хора на България на едно място. Преди да го поканя него, сеща ли се кой е той? Я опитайте. Да, да, да Рин също има престъпен пръст, но кой е, кой е човека, който според вас може да организира училища от цяла България? Училища. Кой? Ама аз като ви казвам, че сте на умните хора на България, това е доказателството. Сега обаче това ще бъде от мене последната дума на български пред вас. И ще ви кажа защо. Не защото не съм горд българин, Тези от вас, които ме познават, знаят, че съм горд българин. И където и да отида по света, аз винаги ще бъда българинът Плама Русев. Ще мина на английски, защото вие стоите на тези седялки, на които стояха 120 държави. И моето послание към вас е следното. Ако искате да бъдете успешни в световен мащаб, българският ще ви помогне до толкова доколкото през него да изкажете най-красивото, което имате, своите мисли и чувства. От там татка за бизнес ще ви трябва поне в следващите още 3 до 5 години английски. Колко от вас не говорят английски в тази зала? Вдигнете си ръката. 
E, vije ste gotovi. Thank you, Wembley. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I will take the role now because I want to have the pleasure to invite here a person who first believed in my crazy ideas and dreams and second decided that will change the system and will make a difference. The Minister of Education of Republic of Bulgaria, Mr. Vochev. как да говоря на английски на български министър. Господин министър, благодаря ви. Благодаря за това, че ето тези страхотни млади хора са тук сред нас и благодаря за това, че успяхте една администрация да накарате за 2-3 седмици отново да направи чудото, да напълним зала едно на НДК с цвета на българската нация. Вие сте в зала едно на НДК и Веселин Маринов не пее! А има министър! Господин министър! Благодаря на Пламен, благодаря на всички ваш, че дойдох и се отзовахте на поканата. С Пламен се познаваме от няколко години, но още първият път, който се запознахме, ми направи впечатление колко е вдъхновяваш. Аз не мога, като него признавам се, Мога да говоря равномерно, сравнително интелигентно, да водя нормални, да създам добра обстановка за полузатворен делови разговор, но не мога да вдъхновявам. А днес най-важното е да ви вдъхновим. Образователната система има много задачи. Образователната система трябва да ви научи на прави така, че да придобиете знания, да ви направи пригодни за живота, да ви възпита но най-важното, което днес трябва да направи образователната система е да ви вдъхнови. Да вдъхнови младите хора. Не само в България, но в всички части на света. Вдъхновението е това, в което най-голяма степен определя и човешкия живот. Заради нещата, които ни вдъхновяват, заради вдъхновението ни правим важни житейски избори, развиваме интереси в една или друга област, за да обучаваме се, в една или в друга област, заобичваме нещо или някого. Човешкото научно и технологично развитие се е движило най-вече благодарение на вдъхновението. Ени хора са се със светли умове, с голямо въображение, са се вдъхновили от науката, вдъхновили са се от знанието на хората, знанието създадено от хората преди тях, които пък също са се вдъхновили. И така, крачка по крачка, не сме достигнали впечатляващо технологично развитие, което все още е твърде малко на фона на това, което ще се случи. Само ако погледнем един смартфон, който държим или телефон в ръцете си, направим равносметка колко много открития стоят за тяна технология. Технологиите не вдъхновяват, технологиите може би в най-голяма степен не вдъхновяват и това беше една от причините да решим да подкрепим, да участваме в организацията на днешното събитие за да вдъхновим всеки един от вас. По-важно е всеки един от вас да се вдъхнови от знанието и от науката. Пожелавам ви на всички да се вдъхновите от знанието, да откриете вселената на вашето въображение и да се почувствате щастливи от това. Успех на всички! Само не мога да разбера защо казвате, че не вдъхновявате. Някой го правят с действията си, вие сте един от тях. Благодаря много, господин министр. Благодаря за това, че всички те са тук. All right now. I have the right of a first keynote because I'm the organizer, so they said do it. It's real honor to co-organize something with a ministry because at the end of the day we wouldn't be able to do it alone. We don't know who are the excellent students 
within the different cities that you come from. And I will come to you now to get a clear understanding where you come from. But as much as I remember last year, there were like almost every single city in Bulgaria. And that was the initial idea, to bring and to inspire your future. Now here you will see beautiful, amazing, strange, weird things. But that's life. We are not going to protect you from seeing the future. We want to show you the future so you digest it in your brains and find your anomaly. Do you know what I mean? Anomaly. I am an anomaly. I am from Varna and I grew up in the East years before. And during these years, there were different type of people. Some people were more beloved than others. I was not supposed to be something. But my life changed. Things changed. You know what I mean? And I received the right, if I do things right, to have success. Not in Bulgaria that much, internationally. And the only reason I did this, because I was never afraid of the future. Only people who lack self-confidence are afraid of the future. You should never question yourself. You just need to help yourself and become better in the future. And now let me tell you what I mean. Think about it. When you were born, did you have your brain with the intelligence level that you have now? Or it was somebody like doing nothing? You cannot even stand up, right? It takes time. You don't know because maybe you don't remember, but I have two kids, eight and nine, and I know what it is. It's not the brain that makes you a human. It's the heart that makes you a person. It is the heart that needs to be bigger than the brain. And then everything happens in a perfect way. Here at Webet, we bring together people from 120 different countries. You know that Bulgaria has been established in the year of 681. Since 681 till 2019, there are exactly 1,338 years. You don't expect anything new to happen during these years. But today, you are in a very historic moment. Today, something new has happened. For the first time in the history of Bulgaria, there are 120 countries landing in this city. How about that for a first time? Would you accept somebody to tell you that something is impossible? How impossible this could be? To bring people like my dear friends, for example, Jesus over there, Jesus Mantas. Jesus, may I ask you to stand up, please? I know I'm asking too much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Jesus Mantas is the managing director, managing partner of a 17 billion unit of IBM. 17 billion unit. And he's here in this very room with you. How about that? There is nothing impossible. That's what I'm telling you. So, what is next? All of you, one day, Hopefully, we'll be a very successful people. All of you, one day, hopefully, will carry your big hearts. Because only the big heart is the best investment you can do in your future. Because with the big heart, you will help others. And others will help others. And the more people you help, the more you invest your own, your, in your own future. That's the only way to make sure that you live a happy and wonderful life. Because once you help somebody, this somebody will remember you. 
And then there will be many people who remember you. And isn't it what really matters? To be remembered. Everything else is vanity. If you change one person's life only in your life, you will do more than you would have ever expected from yourself. Artificial intelligence is going to change everything. Looking at me now, you look at yourself. I'm sure that you still have fresh memories from the ancient Greek methodology, aren't you? You remember the gods? You remember Zeus? Zeus the thunder maker? I'm telling you, now there are many people here around us, because we had a defense summit today, and others who can throw bigger thunders than Zeus. Do you know Hermes? I don't mean the producer of the bags. I mean the god. He was flying very fast, sending messages around. Well, let me tell you a big secret. We all fly faster than Hermes these days. Much faster and much higher. What I'm saying is that we are more gods than the gods of the ancient Greeks methodology. You are more gods than any god that you have read about at school. The question is, do you realize it? The question is, how do you use that goddess special thing that you are empowered now through technology to make a better world? I mean, when you read the methodology, you say, oh my God, why is this God doing this? Why is he killing this guy or why is he doing? Well, ask yourself, why are you doing it? And what can you do better? Every second of your life, what can you do better now, at that moment? Being gods comes with some pros and cons. The cons, though, are that artificial intelligence is becoming more and more intelligent. If you ask yourself, how is it possible the man to be stronger than the lion, if the lions are so strong. It's all about one thing, what I've started, community. Helping each other, building layers of communication, having aligned interests. Communities are built around shared necessities. That's what communities are. Here, you are now my community, my family, and we have one necessity. Start jumping this country. That's my necessity, and I hope yours. So, how is it possible that we are stronger than lions? Because we communicate better than the lions. Because we talk to each other, share values, share dreams, and we are there. We are connected. The problem with the connections with the humankind is that we recently will, and we often become disconnected. We meet now, maybe we meet in three years, maybe we need meet in five years, maybe we meet in ten years. The beauty of the artificial intelligence is it, that it's always connected. So, tell me, you're the brightest of Bulgarians. Would the AI be stronger than us? if we are stronger than the lions because we are connected? What do you think? Would it be? What do you think? Is it the human or the AI being stronger? What? Human or AI? So this half goes for AI, this half goes for human. I also believe it will be human, but only if we are connected. Only if we stay connected and we build stronger connections between us. But do we have to compare? Remember, if you go for the religion, it's the God who created the human. What about now? It's the human who creates the AI. Because there is nothing artificial about the artificial intelligence. It's 
made by humans with the values of the humans who made it. So if the values of those who made are good, we have a good AI. If the values of those who made are bad, we have a bad AI. Good and bad, who knows what is good and what is bad. What we know for sure is that when it's time for you to go for work, there will be most probably no drivers. There will be most probably very few lawyers. At that moment of development, there will be zero miners. And I don't mean crypto miners. I mean the miners who die every day breathing the dust under the ground. And there will be a lot of other professions missing. There will be new ones coming up on the market. Now, my question is, where will be my country in five to seven years' time? When will be these amazing people sitting in these chairs now in Zala Edno and Deka? Well, I know where I want you to be, and I know where I want to see Bulgaria to be. A local superpower, a local technological superpower, a leader in the region, creating massive opportunities for young people to be here, to create more opportunities for other young people to come here. That's where I want to see my country. And I tell you how we are going to do this. It's not that difficult. First, education doesn't finish at the moment you finish school. Education from now on will go on and on and on until the end of your life. Professions are nothing to do with the professions that the history knows. Your fathers, your mothers, they start one profession, they end the same profession, they retire. Nothing like this in the future. You will be working one thing today, another thing tomorrow, and third thing the next morning. It's that fast, and it is that dynamic. And it means that you have to study and to learn every day. And as I said, every second you have to do the best you can. All the things you will see here today are things that were made by people who never stopped dreaming. Are things are made by people who never stopped learning. And are things made by people who Webit believes have good hearts. Because at the end, it's all about the good heart. Because the good heart will create good AI. The good AI will create better future for all of us. That's why we care about the hearts more than the brains. But hearts are teaching our brains. So that's what I believe in. And I hope all of you young, amazing people will talk to your hearts more often and they will tell you what's next. Because it was the heart that was beating first before your brain starts telling you even to go to the toilet. It took about a year and a half, two for my kids to know that. And it took those two hands to take the result out of it. With this, I will stop. And I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. There are microphones over there. I don't, hear, I don't see what time is it and how much time I have. But I'll be happy to answer questions. And one thing is for sure, you are in the best place, in the best time. There is really no better place. Outside, there are seven companies from the Silicon Valley who came all the way from San Francisco, from other places, to pitch in our Founders Games. Can you imagine how we changed the narrative? Can you imagine that a company that is in the mecca of the investments perceive Sofia as a place to be successful. Do you think that if they think that they can be successful and fly over the Atlantic, you cannot be successful? 
Do you think that if we can attract 120 people here, you cannot do other miracles? Do you think that if three years ago the global media were calling Sofia the capital of the poorest country in EU, and now they're calling it how? Digital capital. It's a nice change of narrative for three years only, before and after Webit. Do you think that things are impossible? It's the best place to be. Bulgaria now is the best place to be. A place of freedom, and I mean it, and you will know what I mean if you go and live somewhere else. A place of unlimited opportunities. Just grab them and take control. I never stop learning. Two months ago, I did another PhD in telemedicine. Uh, five, four or five days ago, the Harvard awarded me and appointed me as part of their faculty of, of uh, the, uh, thanks to a dear friend of mine here, seeing if, if Shafi Ahmed is here. Shafi, are you here? Shafi Ahmed? Where are you, brother? In the back. In the back? <laughs> there he is. <laughs> yeah, do you see him over there? At the end of the day, it matters about your heart and about the people you know. My heart connected me with Shafi. My heart connected me with Jesus Mantas. My heart connects me with everybody here. And my heart now is connected to your hearts. So let's see where this will take us. Thank you so much for being here. But above all, thank you so much for being an excellent student. Thank you for yourself. Thank you. There are microphones. Please take them here in front over there. Take them for questions. And in the meantime, while we go there, let me tell you one more thing about this person. Dari, please come to me. Because um, I am proud of people who never give up their dreams. I'm presenting you another dreamer here next to me. Do you know who he is, right? What is he doing? <laughs> what? Uchese. It's Uchese. So give a round of applause to this person who recorded when I met Daddy, it was like two, three, four years ago. Yeah. Two, three, four years ago. And I, I went to his website and I already heard his voice. And every single video on his website was with his voice. Hundreds of videos, thousands of videos. This person next to me worked like a dog. Recording, recording, drawing, recording, drawing. It's impossible. I cannot even comprehend how much hours he spent in front of the microphone, in front of the, the laptop or whatever he is using and recording how committed you should be to change or to support the education in a country, but to do this in such a way. Darin Majarov, great guy. And I am very, very honored that he accepted, together with the wonderful Mrs. Gramatik over here, to host this event. So do you have questions? I don't see the, can you, can you light up the room, please, a little bit? Okay, oh, much better. Oh, full room, nice. <laughs> Do you see the microphones? All right, you know everything. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Enjoy the rest of the show. I, before you leave, before you leave, uh, I just want to say maybe on behalf of uh, all the young people that are here, um, thank you for being such a, an enormous leader in Bulgaria. It is a pri privilege for all of us to have the chance to learn from you. And on behalf of all the young people, I can tell you that we're going to do our best to try and learn as much as we can, get better, and even get better than you, so that those... Oh, that's easy. <laughs> <laughs> so that these historic events continue in Bulgaria, and in 20, 30, 40 years, we're going to live uh, in even a better Bulgaria than today. Thank you very much. We would need a good minister also, so we work <laughs> together. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Plamen, Plamen. There's one question. Plamen. Yeah. Okay. We have a question. Oh. We didn't see him. He's just here for you. Uh, I have a uh, rather, I'd say, could be disturbing question. I like uh, disturbing is, questions. Uh, whether this uh, great technological advancement you speak of can be used against people like us, against society in general. Uh, we have seen, for example, in the, I think, 70s, GPS was actually developed as a weapon rather than as a tool to well, determine where you are. So do you think that such exam exam examples sorry, can repeat themselves in the near and the farther away future? Absolutely. What is your name and where are you from? I'm Vasil. I'm from Sofia. I, uh, I study at NEPMG, Academy of Whoa, whoa. <laughs> All right, Vasil. Thanks for the question. Well, I, I, would, I, would, I would give a very simple answer. Um, technology is a very good uh, servant and a very bad, bad master. That's a very simple answer. At the moment, you, we as humankind do not put our efforts in making our lives better, but put our efforts in developing technology just for the sake of developing of technology, then we have lost it. I love people. I don't love technology. Technology is my business. It is the area where I do investments. It is the area where I believe I can help Bulgaria, and we all help Bulgaria the most. And we use technology as a tool to bring all these amazing people in one place and challenge the future together. But that's what I'm talking about, the heart. We should share the same values so we can really be aligned and really do things that matter for us, the humans, above all. And not only the humans, but the planet itself. It's very important. And yes, of course it could be used. And yes, of course they are already used. And yes, of course, we will do our best to make sure that at the end of the day, the result is that we improve the state of well-being for the people. There are many bad people out there, but also there are even more great people out there. The humankind is a beautiful collection of good and bad, white and black, yellow and red. It's all amazing. The beauty of us is that we are so diverse. That's what makes us very strong. With AI, it's an algorithm. In most of the cases, there is one right answer. With us, the humans, if I ask you, 20 people, 23 opinions, and that's the beauty of it. People need to learn to cherish diversity. Our team, we have now a beautiful lady from Syria who was a refugee, and uh, she's out there somewhere, Neely. We have uh, Sami coming from Ghana. And uh, Sami, are you here? Come here, Sami. <laughs> there he is. A very cool guy, a very, very cool guy. Yeah. So um, diversity is key for our happiness. And that's our main advantage to AI and to technology. We are beautifully different. Please never ask anybody to be like you. That's the worst you can do for yourself. We should dream different. We should do different. That's the only way we can be happy, if that answers your question. To some extent, yes. Uh, <laughs> thank you, nonetheless. So you're a mathematician. You want me yes and no, right? Uh, is the algorithm there that is missing? No, 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 not really. I just, uh, you, you, you told me the answer. Is, it was just kind of uh, in the midst of everything you said. And it's that there are a lot of bad people and even more, even more good people in this world. And we, as, well, hopefully good people, we just have to outdo ourselves in order to advance humankind in general, outweighing all harm that could be done to mankind itself. At least that's my take on it. 
do you realize how important and how complex is your question? There are a lot of people from our VVIPs, our speakers. I mean, if they can answer this question, then we don't need to get together anymore at Webit. Every year we need to talk about it, we need to discuss it. Every year we have to catch up with the development of technologies. Every year we have to find more answers. But at the end of the day, it's not about the answers. At the end of the day, what really matters is the questions. We as community, we as society, do not need to give answers. We should ask the right questions. Because if you ask a stupid question, you get a stupid answer. If you get the, to, write the, ask, to, write the, to ask the right question, then that's a great way ahead to the future. So you just ask one of the best questions possible. The problem is that that's the only answer I can give you. Of course. Uh, I still believe this question has to be asked, though, as technolo technology by itself kind of is there, as you said. Uh, for the sake of technology. We as humans, uh, the creators of technology, we have to also look at w what we are doing with it, not only what we are doing as it itself. Take his name, I want him speaker next webit. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much. A big round of applause for Plowman. See, this is what happens when the Ministry of Education and Science brings 3,000 of the smartest and most talented kids in Bulgaria. So give it up for yourselves one more time. Uh, and now, with that being said, I don't see a reason why we shouldn't move to the more ceremonial part of the evening. I mean, we told you it was an award show as well, didn't we? Of course. So, for the last 11 years, Swebet has been making incredible efforts in enabling business opportunities on a global scale. Which is why, tonight, we decided to distinguish some of those who have worked actively in developing entrepreneurial activities around the world. The first category that will be presented on that very stage is Empowering Entrepreneurial Ecosystem where we have extraordinary companies working every day to create business opportunities for others. True. Our first nominee is Microsoft, a company that has moved the hearts of every computer user with their mission to empower us to create a better future. Applause, please, for <laughs> them. They deserve it. The second nominee is Lakestar, a venture capital firm that invests in outstanding digital and technology entrepreneurs worldwide. Yep. Our third nominee in this category is Airbus Labs, a global aerospace accelerator where startups and Airbus entrepreneurs speed up the transformation of new ideas into valuable businesses. <laughs> and now, the award for empowering entrepreneurial ecosystem will be presented by the executive director of Visa for Southeastern Europe, Berna Ullmann. She's a senior executive with over 30 years of professional experience in payments and finance, currently responsible for delivering strategies and business growth in nine markets. Please welcome Ms. Berna Ullmann. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm delighted to announce the winner for the category of Empowering Entrepreneurial Ecosystem. And the winner is Microsoft. Bill Gates around? <laughs> I guess not. 
Okay, so we will make sure that the award goes to a Microsoft Perfect. representative. Thank you, Ms. Brenda Thank Ullman. You. Thank you very much, and congratulations to Microsoft once more. Congratulations to Microsoft indeed. And now, now is the time to announce the demonstration of the first of many incredible technologies. EnduroSat designs and engineers smart and affordable spacecraft for business applications and space exploration missions. And Durosat's mission is to provide simpler access to space for visionary business customers, scientists, and technologists. It is a new type of interconnected and decentralized space infrastructure. So please welcome on stage the founder and CEO of Endurosat, Raicho Raichev. Can we give a clicker to this wonderful man, Bulgarian inventor, Vaito Rajev? Thank you. He's a high-tech guy. He needs high-tech equipment, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Good. My name is Raicho. I'm from Endurosat. And this is what we are actually building, satellites. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about our story, about how we began, and hopefully inspire a few of you to do crazy shit in your life as well. Uh, so I started as a kid, and I always have a dream. I want to go to space, no matter what. Now, when I was a kid, of course, I bumped my head too many times and frequently, so I don't remember some concrete aha moment that made me realize how much I love space and how much I want to get to space myself. This continued into high school years. And a word of advice, when you go the first day in high school, don't tell like me I'm going to become an astronaut to everyone that you meet. Basically, I was not the most popular kid in school, for sure. But my dream continues further. I was still enthusiastic about it. I always dreamed, could I contribute? Could I build spacecraft technology? Could I go and inspect my spacecraft in orbit someday? And this continued into my late years. And after graduating university and working, I decided, OK, I cannot stand anymore. I have to really pick up my stuff and uh, try to create something in reality. I had a really reasonable idea. I would do a private satellite company in Bulgaria. What could go wrong, right? This was my idea. And no, 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 this is uh, <laughs> I'm serious. Uh, wait for the next part. So I, I made a list of partners, potential partners, organizations who would definitely be interested to invest and support my private space Bulgarian program. I went, and before going to, to meet these people, I was thinking only one thing. Man, I will have one problem. If I go and speak with all these around 30 people that I'm thinking about, probably I'll have to turn quite a few of them down, because they, all of them would necessarily want to invest, they would want to help me. And I was, I was training more about how to politely reject partnerships. Actually, it didn't go well as, a, as I planned. From the 30 organizations that I spoke with, it turns out that most of them had a better job to do, especially two of them. By the time that I entered and I thought, hi, I'm right, I'm going to build satellite technologies, and the guys were already calling the security guards, and they literally escorted me outside of their office. So basically, from 30, and 30 more uh, answers, uh, you can see the, the oh, just a second. You can see the result, basically. The result was amazing. So as a, as a really smart guy, I fell in depression directly. And I thought to myself, you know what? Uh, people don't get me. Uh, there is something wrong. I don't, I don't know what to do. In general, three months passed. I was super depressed. But nevertheless, this passion about space, this, this some cow internal energy kept me going. And I decided, OK, no way. I'm going back to the drawing board. But this time, I'm going to take a team with me. And why do you need a team? In my opinion, when I started with the team was, you know what? It would be good to have someone to blame about the failures instead of myself only. 
This was my first idea. But more, more importantly, you rapidly realize you cannot create in your lifetime something significant without smart people supporting it, without partnerships, without people around you to really put the edge on, uh, on your program. And this is what actually happens with us. I was so, so fortunate to start with five guys, uh, the program that we call today Endurosat as a company. And we started in a small attic apartment in Sofia, in a small building in the center, about 25 square meter office, let's call it, alternatively. And because we didn't have enough money, we were constantly going around the stairs of the building with the cables and electronics in the hands. And of course, the old lady that was uh, monitoring the, all the activities, like every building has an old, older person monitoring the activities, she, she got really suspicious about us. And I don't think that I helped a lot with my explanation that we are actually building satellites. Um, then it became clear that we need support and we needed a financing as well, because you cannot go to deep tech programs without financing. And I was fortunate enough that after three months, I, it, I went back and spoke to some of the people that I met during my first disastrous meetings. This time, however, we found proper partners. We found Bulgarian entrepreneurs who believed in us and put money in the program so that we can keep running. By the way, the first five conversations when we were really at the edge, at the beginning of the program, were also disastrous. Uh, they were from no to hell no all the time. But when I go back to the office, I consider it a partial success. Uh, this is what I was telling the team. The team was asking, hey, how, how did it go, the investment meeting? Oh, very well. It was partially successful. Well, at the end of the day, we started building systems. We, we started building satellites, and this is, this is when you realize you need team, you need partners, and you need to really be open about the mistakes that you do in your lifetimes, and especially when you create something significant as a satellite technology or a spacecraft. This is how Endurosat started. And everything around Endurosat is basically based on a very simple principle that I don't know if you believe in, but I tr trust me on that. It was hard work, everyday sacrifice, efforts, and most of, most of all, what we Bulgarians have in uh, abundance, stubbornness. A lot of stubbornness. Today, the, the space sector has changed dramatically. Basically, five years ago, the satellite world had one simple uh, game. My satellite is bigger than your satellite. This changed rapidly. Today, five years later, the battle is efficiency. How fast could I launch spacecraft into orbit and how, how much data could I get from my spacecraft on demand? And this is what we are doing. You can see on the bottom of the screen satellite like this compared with a big system of a modern satellite. What we do with Endurosat now, it's something that I'm really proud of. And by the way, this is a result of a work of more than 30 people, young people like yourselves in about four years sleepless nights, scandals in the office, no ice-breaking games, no, uh, no, uh, no uh, enjoyment in many cases. But today, we are proud to give you a real spacecraft. This in front of you is a satellite capable of emitting more than 150 megabits speed of transmission from space to the ground. It could uh, work in lower orbit. It could work under severe temperature differences and radiation. It could carry amazing amounts of payloads in the process. And by the way, this small square box moves with uh, around 30,000 kilometers per hour once in orbit. And yes, we are already flying several of our systems in orbit. Uh, this spacecraft could really benefit humanity. We believe so. And this is why we are proud to work today with leading institutes, leading universities, space agencies around the planet, and of course, commercial satellite companies. What, what these satellites provide you with is capability that you haven't uh, had before on a very low price to have incredible amount of payload space so that you can fly your camera in space and monitor the ground so, uh, so you can take high-resolution photos or videos. You can connect with a 5G IoT connection and networks all around the planet. You can transmit point-to-point -point communication. This is what this satellite is, is capable of. And we're really proud that the entire design, engineering, know-how, and the production is in Bulgaria. And, and we are keeping, keep growing the company. So if some of you is crazy and audacious enough to 
come and talk to me about uh, internships or uh, future jobs. Uh, hopefully, we are alive by then as a company and we can offer you something interesting in the process. And last but not least, I want to tell you something. Really focus on what matters in your lives. I know that today the media, the, there is a lot of social media, a lot of distractions, but at the end, success comes to the hard workers. Success comes at a very high price, but it's worth it. Because once you see something that was a vision in your head and today's reality, you feel almost like godlike. You are a creator from my mind, to, from a concept to a real spacecraft. And I, and I really trust that among you will be a lot of people, and I'm serious about it, that would not only outcompete what we have done so far, but it will, they will bring Bulgaria and, and, the, and our planet closer to the stars. So be stubborn, work hard, and thanks for uh, listening to my presentation. On the website, if someone is crazy passionate about space, this is the biggest online educational platform for, uh, in Europe, and we founded it. So there is a lot of free information available if you want to learn more about how to build spacecraft technology. Thank you, and good luck to the conference. Thank you very much, Raicho. Thank you. A big round of applause for this young and amazing man. Thank you. Our next speaker is one of the world's top space visionaries and is credited with helping create the new commercial space industry, whose players include Richard Branson, Elon Musk, Paul Allen, and Jeff Bezos. His world-changing work, in 2015, he won the World Technology Award. Considered one of the best speakers in the space field, he is also a writer, a policy expert, and a congressional witness. Please welcome Mr. Rick Tomlinson. like a rock star. Dobro vietcher. My name is Rick. You know, they told me tonight I was going to be speaking to some students, and I thought they meant like maybe 20, 25 students. I was just going to sit in a room and chat. Uh, so I really didn't prepare a presentation. So I'm going to show you what I'm going to do tomorrow night. So we're going to crab 15 minutes into 10 and see if we can get this thing done. If we can make the AV work. There it is. So this is cool, right? Have you guys seen this? The car that got launched into space? This thing was awesome. So we're kind of going to go on a ride here tonight. And I mean, that is really cool stuff. I want that. I want to be that guy. But you know what? It, it's not really about this. It's not really about these guys. It's not really about Elon Musk. It's not really about Jeff Bezos. What it's really about is her, the mother world, the earth. This is the place that we care about. I know these guys, I know Jeff, I know Elon. This is what they care about. They care about the earth. They care about the living things on the earth. The flowers, the trees, the living creatures that populate the planet. We have an amazing place. It's our home. Incredible. We haven't done real well with it. But it is ours, and we're in charge of it. But we're also in charge of ourselves. And what I like about human beings is actually, no matter what you see on the news all the time, you know, no matter what you hear, the reports you hear, people are actually pretty cool. People are pretty good. I actually like people. People do nice stuff. I don't have a problem with us. So I want to save this planet. The problem is we've been locked in our thinking. We've been locked into just, this is it. Now we started to go out into the universe at one point during the Cold War, Sputnik. We started to reach out of the gravity well and go out there. 
But it was a very terrible time even then. We had prejudice around the world. We had terrible things happening. We had riots, racism. The Cold War. Hatred. People fighting people. We had the threat of death. When I was growing up, we actually used to hide under desks during drills because we thought there might be a nuclear war. Now, I don't know how a desk is going to protect you in a nuclear war, but it made us feel better. There was a clock that was set up. The idea was we were counting down to the end of the world. But the interesting thing is that the first space race gave us something else. The very rockets, the very technology, the very capabilities that would have allowed us to destroy the planet were the ones that began to allow us to leave the planet for the first time. And once we were out there, some other things that were very amazing happened. The very first time we were able to step back from the planet Earth and look at our mother. And we were able to see what a beautiful place we have, a beautiful place we come from. There was something else that happened, not just the technology, because there were a bunch of kids growing up during this period. Kids who were watching the space race and flipping the channel and seeing Star Trek, seeing Star Wars, going to the theater, Han Solo, Leia. We thought at the time that we were going to be going into space so cheaply, it'd be 50 times a year, less than 100 US dollars per kilo to go into space. It didn't really happen. We ended up with a large government space station. And in the meantime, the world got ugly again. And here we are now, in a world that has so much hatred. People saying, stay out, go away, don't come into my place. We're crowded. We're changing the planet. Crystal clear. And just so much greed. It's all about me. It's all about give me more, no. give me bigger, give me better. Yeah, and then we got that guy. Just skip right past him. Oh. And guess what? The clock is there again, and our greed has started to harm the planet. But guess what? Those kids, those kids that were watching those shows, those kids that were watching Star Trek and Star Wars and Space Shuttle and astronauts and cosmonauts doing incredible things in space grew up. And they started building their own space companies, their own space enterprises. Jeff Bezos announced this two weeks ago. Commercial spacecraft going to the moon. SpaceX. Crystal clear. I love the fact that this looks like it's right out of a movie, but that's a real rocket ship. It's coming right now. And within our lifetime, within your lifetime in particular, in your lifetime, you're going to be able to take these ships and ride them out to the frontier of space. You. There is more than one person in this room right now who is going to have the opportunity and probably will step onto another world. Think about that. You know who you are. I can't see you from here, but you're hearing something as I'm talking to you because you know you're that person. And as we do, we get to change the way we interact with this planet, the way we interact with each other. So rather than attacking the earth, bulldozing, tearing it apart, for the first time in the history of life itself, we will be able to carry the seeds of life into space. The same technologies that allowed us to kill will now allow us to plant. But we also have to be able to protect this world because it's going to be no good if all of a sudden a big rock falls out of the sky. So one of the things we're looking at is how do we do that? And what's interesting is we begin to go out into the solar system and study the asteroids and learn how, they're, how they operate, how they fly, what the opportunities are. We're going to be able to build from what we learn while we're there. We'll be able to understand the resources of space. I had a little asteroid mining company a couple of years ago called Deep Space Industries. We were looking into that. At the same time, as we're heating the planet, we're starting to reach a point where I don't want to say this will happen. I don't believe it'll happen. I hope it doesn't happen. But we could hit what's called runaway greenhouse, at which point the planet starts to heat itself faster than it cools. 
and we start turning the Earth into Venus. Now, you guys are all science nerds just like me, and you know Venus is not a happy place, unless you want to bake something. But it could happen here. So what about if we were able to put objects between the Earth and the Sun? Now, this is only if things got terrible. This is only if things got really, really bad. But what if we could move some of those asteroids? What if we could take large solar sails and put them between the Earth and the Sun and create a little bit of shade so that we could have a little bit of time to change the planet, to save ourselves? And again, at the end of it, we've got capabilities. At the end of it, we will know how to do things. At the end of it, we will have the technologies necessary to begin building civilizations in space. And guess what? At the same time, we will learn how to work together. The whole idea of families falling apart, think about it. If you're living in a sealed bubble, that's your family. And you better bloody well trust everybody in that house. We will take care of each other. And yes, AI will come with us. And we'll be able to build. We'll be able to build incredible things. Everything I show you here is possible with today's technology. None of this is magic, beat me up, Scotty stuff. It is all capable. We have the capability right now to make it all happen. It's all possible. The moon, Mars, we can be there. We can go there. We can live there. It's just incredible. You and I working together on something grand, something exciting. Space solar power plants, cities in space. That's a kilometer long city that rotates to provide gravity. We could have built this 30 or 40 years ago. We just hadn't decided to yet. We didn't know we could. And what's really great, this time we go together. The US, Russia, Europe, Bulgaria, China. We can do this as a united human species. We can save the planet, we can save ourselves, and rather than looking down at the darkness that we find ourselves in now, we can look up into the stars, into the heavens, and we can see a possibility of a future that we share. And this time we aren't taking it from anybody. This time we give it to everybody, and we break out of the cage. It's time to dream. It's time for you to dream. Stay in school, study, learn. Learn everything you can. Do everything you can. Become everything you can because you are limitless. The universe is limitless and it's calling you. Again, I don't know which one of you it is, but one of you is gonna go out there and make it happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for these very touching words. Thank you. <laughs> very inspirational, right? <laughs> All right. Okay, how do you follow a speech like that? <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, just unriddle with this, how do you follow a speech like oh, that? Oh, Pauline is here. <laughs> Would you Pauline mind if I here. join you for a second? Yes. Yep. Yes, we do mind. You know, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you know, I was listening to this amazing presentation, and this was given just, just now to me by a friend the clinical professor from Northwest University, the Kellogg Business School of Management. His uh, amazing kindness, <laughs> Professor Rob Wolcott. And last year I announced him because he was uh, in the shoes of uh, Daddy. He was the, the, he accepted my offer, my, my, my request to be the, the host. And when I presented him, I presented him as somebody who can skyrocket the career of every one of you. Uh, but the reason I'm here is because I've listened so much about the stars that I imagine that we are all our own stars sending light, beams of light to our future. And now I have a request for you. I want to shine upon your future. And I want you to help me to make your future brighter. I would like to share all my light with you. And I hope you will share 
Your lights with me. I see your lights. It is at the moment when the dark comes, when we know that light will make the difference. You are our difference. You are the difference for this country. And you are the reason for me for doing everything that I'm doing here for Bulgaria, for Europe, for the humankind as much as I can. Thank you so much for being so amazing. Now our lights are together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was really beautiful looking from the stage. You couldn't see it, but it was amazing. And now I think it's time for a second award of the night, don't you think? So? Right, right. Okay. Absolutely. So our second award for the night is Best Use of Artificial Intelligence, a field that was once dubbed by many publications as all hype and no action. Yeah, and boy, were they wrong. I bet they feel really Absolutely. stupid tonight. So the living proof of that are no, our nominees who are the living proof that they were completely wrong. And now the first nominee. He is the founder and CEO of Uplus, Shaukat Shamim. He is a serial entrepreneur and has founded many successful companies over the years. He led the creation of one of the first messaging platforms, Yahoo Messenger. Our second nominee is the CEO of Furhat Robots, Samer Al Mubayet. The young entrepreneur has a PhD in speech technology and is the winner of multiple awards. He is one of the creators of the amazing Four Hot Robots, which I bet you've seen all over the internet. The third nominee is Tatiana Kanzavelli. She has been featured in the White House blog, spoke at the United Nations, and has been recognized as one of the top 10 influential women in healthcare IT in 2015. Today, she is the founder and CEO of Open Health Network, a mentor at 500 startups and Richard Branson Entrepreneur Center. Applause for her. Yay for girl power. <laughs> the award for best use of AI will be presented by the managing partner of global strategy offerings and digital innovation at IBM, Mr. Jesus Mantas. Thank you very much for being here. Please make your way to the stage. I think everybody knows me by now. I did not plan on that. Um, I have the envelope. Uh, three great uh, individuals that have uh, worked hard at the area of uh, artificial intelligence. And um, I think everybody is waiting to hear. Oh, you, you want me to hold the envelope? Surprise for you. OK, very good. <laughs> the before, second surprise in 30 minutes for me. <laughs> before sharing with us the winner, Yes. can you maybe share a few inspiring words to those hundreds of young people who are here with us today? Um, Plumman said enormous words for you, and I'm sure that uh, even if you say a few sentences, you can change the lives of some people here. Um, that's very kind of Plumman. And uh, believe me, uh, uh, boys and girls, I will get him for this later. Uh, <laughs> you know, this is, uh, his, he did not tell me this. You have, um, ten, you have 10 minutes even here, you can see on the clock. Oh, wow, That's 10 the minutes. third surprise, I'm kidding. <laughs> OK, well, whenever it goes to zero, I'll stop talking. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'll tell you a little bit. Um, I was born in the, oh, in the south of Spain. Or? And uh, um, you know, uh, when I was growing up, 
uh, a little bit like Clement. I never uh, imagined the kind of things that I would be able to experience. And uh, some of it, it took one, believe. So uh, if I would give you something with you is, if you're really, really, really passionate about something, um, it doesn't really matter what it is. Because when you're passionate about something, you will naturally spend a lot of time on it. And when you spend a lot of time on it, you naturally will become very good. And when you're naturally very good, yeah. you will be better than almost anybody else. And you will certainly succeed because you will master things that will be very, very, very hard for others. So um, that's one thing. The second thing is there will be people in your lives that will believe that you can do things that you cannot believe yourself. Um, find those people, whether you're your parents, whether they're your teachers, and um, let them guide you. Because I have done the kind of things that I've been able to do uh, because I have a lot of people that believed in me more than I believed on myself. How's that for no preparation? Thank you very much. I think everyone here appreciates that. Now, maybe we can see, uh, hear the winner. Out of all of this, I have a new idea for an artificial intelligence uh, application. Uh, it's going to be a public speaking artificial intelligence. <laughs> so whenever you're going to be in an award, you have it. You can put the application, and it's going to do the speech for you. Um, I have the envelope, so no further ado. I'm going to uh, let you know who's going to receive this very, very prestigious award. Shukat Shamim. Congratulations. 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 Now it's your turn. This looks really cool. Uh, thank you, everybody, for, um, for giving us this honor. Uh, we have, this goes to all the people in the company who has worked tirelessly to make this thing happen. And we have some colleagues in, in the audience as well. Congratulations to you all. Laurence, it's our birthday, so please say happy birthday to Laurence. Thank you. Listen, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations one more time from us. Thank you to Mr. Jesus Mantas, who was put on the spot by Darin, but he made a beautifully <laughs> job. <laughs> and now it's time for our second demonstration for tonight. Tonight we will witness the arrival of a new wave of drones, the fully autonomous cargo drone Black Swan that can transport up to 350 kilograms over 2,500 kilometers. A technology like this can be extremely efficient and has the potential to transform whole economies. Please, welcome on the stage the CEO of Dronomics, Svilen Rangelov. <laughs> It's great to be here. My name is Svilen. Together with my brother, who's an aerospace engineer, we started a company called Dronomics. And um, I studied economics, uh, but to me, uh, the, the, the power of aviation to transform how we live is really important. So I'm going to talk about the history of Bulgaria a little bit, uh, because I see a lot of you are students here. Did you know that these guys are Bulgarian? Yeah, they were making airplanes um, almost 100 years ago. Did you know that in the beginning of the 20th century, Bulgaria was one of the leading aviation powers? So, can, do you know what any of these dates mean? 
Anyone? All right. Well, in 1910, Tsar Ferdinand, our, uh, our king, was uh, the first head of state to take a commercial flight out of the whole world. In 1912, Svilengrad, which at the time was called Mustafa Pasha, ended up being the first military airport. People from around the world from, uh, came to visit and see how our military has structured their operations. Because, as you know, uh, it was just barely 10, uh, not even 10 years after the Wright brothers made their first flight at Kitty Hawk in the US, Bouguer was already um, using aviation because in 1912, as you recall um, from history lessons, Bouguer was at the onset of the Balkan Wars. In uh, around the same time, Lieutenant uh, Simeon Petrov made the first successful landing after an engine failure. At the time, aircraft had only one engine, so if it died, chances are the, the, the pilot will. Uh, Lieutenant Simeon Petrov was the first person to actually um, manage to sa safely land, and this informed a lot of other aviators after that how to deal with engine failure mid-flight. In 1912, Radul Milkov and Prodan Tarakchiev uh, you may have heard uh, a few of them as street names. Well, they actually create, uh, were, uh, made the first military flight. Um, they were able to drop some ordnance uh, during a, the attack of uh, Odrin. Raina Kasabova, even more importantly, Raina Kasabova was the first female military pilot in the world. Um, and that's quite a first. And in 1915, Asen Jordanov, uh, who was aged probably, uh, he, he was aged 15, so younger than a lot of you here. He was already building the first Bulgarian aircraft, um, if the clicker would work. <laughs> I'm pressing a wrong button. Ah, there we go. And after that, Bulgaria built three uh, factories for airplane manufacturing. Uh, which in the span of just several decades were able to produce more than a thousand aircraft and to develop 40 new designs. So these are actual photos from Bulgaria from that period. You see the state, uh, Državna Aeroplan Narabutivnice or State Aircraft Workshop in Bujurishte, just outside of Sofia. You had State Aircraft Factory in Lovech. If you see up there, it says Pushene to Zabraneno. Uh, <laughs> so no smoking, guys. Uh, and Caproni Bogerski, which is uh, the, the, the Bulgarian branch of an Italian company that made uh, aircraft, and they actually ended up developing aircraft in Bulgaria. And then, after the Second World War, we were um, invited to close the factories, so we did, and uh, for 70 years, Bulgaria did not produce a single commercial aircraft. And when we started in 2014, we decided to change that um, this is the site of our first workshop. We've since moved, but um, right now our goal at Dronomics is to democratize aviation, to, to develop it in Bulgaria and also to bring, it, uh, bring local aircraft manufacturing in many countries around the world, which currently, are, uh, currently do not have these capabilities. So we are now a team of 20 people. We have um, some really amazing advisors. And we are also the first and only strategic partner of IATA worldwide. IATA is the International Air Transport Association, or the, the, the trade body of airlines worldwide. And the big thing that we're trying to solve is that everything nowadays is on demand, right? We're here at Webit because we love the web. We love what it's given us, the power of now. You want a taxi, you get it now. You want food, you get it now. Well, same with goods that we purchase. Uh, a lot of times we don't just go to the store, we, we order it uh, on our phones. But the infrastructure is not really there, right? Uh, in many places around the world, and even in Bulgaria, um, you could wish for better loads. Now, the way to change this is to use aviation. Uh, but aviation is very expensive. So we've tried to create a new type of vehicle that will lower the cost of air cargo, um, to the point of almost matching trucking. And we call this creature the black swan because it's so difficult to create new technology that it's affordable. Um, the black swan will be the size of a flying delivery van, if you will, or a bunny charka, uh, for those of you who speak Bulgarian. <laughs> yes, that's correct. We thought 
we need to be cheap, so we need to land on a runway, so that means we need to be offloaded onto ground vehicle, the most common ground vehicle for delivery is something the size of a bunny charco. Um, we, I want to show you a quick video of some of the tests that we've done here in Bulgaria. This is just a subscale prototype. Uh, these are, this is actual live footage from, uh, well not live, but f footage from, uh, from an airfield near Sofia. And um, the actual aircraft will be the size of a two-seater uh, Cessna. So the wingspan will be 16 meters, the length will be eight meters. Uh, it will be able to transport 350 kilograms at a distance of 2,500 kilometers. Um, we're also developing the whole ecosystem. We're, we're working on the ground stations, we're working on the antennas, the frequencies and so on. Uh, we're able to control it via satellite. And we're also developing the, the drone port infrastructure. So how do we make sure that this aircraft can land in your farm? How, how do we make sure it can land at the warehouse parking lot? How do we make sure it can land at an, a proper, proper airport? And uh, we, we need to be able to integrate all of that into the existing system so that we can achieve our vision of saving Europe for very long We are... Um, Outside of Europe, we're also working on uh, trials with EasyJet in the UK next year, uh, in Japan with the top three airline, and in China as well. Um, our ambition is really to create domestic networks in each of these country, um, uh, countries, and to, to make sure that people who live outside of the big cities get the same level of service as those of us who do uh, live in big cities. We would be really transforming the lives of millions by offering more affordable shipping. Because when you think about it right now, if you're a small entrepreneur from a small city or small village, the, the way for you to, uh, to offer your goods to the whole world is online, but the way to deliver them is offline. So making that bridge as affordable as possible is, is our goal. Um, and I invite you all to, to visit our website. I invite you all to get in touch. We really need a lot of helping hands to make this dream come, uh, become a reality. Um, and thank you again for putting up with me. Thank you. There you go. Thank, thank you very much, very inspiring. Thank you, thank you so much. Our next speaker made world headlines news in 2014 by streaming a live operation using Google Glass to 14,000 students and trainees across 132 countries. In 2016, he performed the world's first virtual reality operation, which was watched by 55,000 people in over 140 countries and reached 4.5 million on Twitter. This is amazing, guys. This person is one of these personalities that makes this world a better place by saving people's lives. Please give a warm welcome to the chairman of Webit Health Summit, Professor Shafi Ahmed. Ahmed. Thank you for the warm um, applause. Thank you very much. Um, it's great to be here for my third year in Bulgaria and Sofia, Webit. It's kind of my second home now. Plamen's my kind of uh, big brother, I guess, I call him. Um, and we have shared some great ideas about how we're going to make the world a better place. It's great to see so many students here uh, from all around Bulgaria. A lot of my work is around teaching and training. And my talk today is based around inspiring all of you Think about how we teach in different ways, how we use different platforms, and how we share knowledge on a global scale. By the end of the talk, hopefully you'll recognize the fact that we should leave knowledge as a legacy for the world, not just to one person, not to two persons, but millions of people who could benefit from that. So the last three or four years, I've traveled quite extensively. I've visited over 35 countries, working with Governments, universities, colleges, think about how we reimagine healthcare, how we reimagine education, how to improve the lives of many. And technology for me 
is the interface for all of those things into how making more um, healthcare and education more affordable, more accessible, and more equitable. We all agree with the premise, of course, that education is a fundamental human right for everybody. We all agree with that premise, I guess, in this audience. The problem, of course, that statement is a fallacy. It's a fallacy because it depends on two things, location and resource, how much money you have and where you happen to be born to access education. But I think we can do better. I think we can make it free for everybody using high-tech, low-cost solutions. In my own practice, I'm a surgeon. I'm a cancer specialist working in London. I'm also the dean of a medical school at Bath's Hospital. And we've been around for a, a long time, since 1123, almost 900 years worth of education and medical school establishment. I've been teaching about this for a long time, this concept of teaching in an auditorium. But actually, the learning in this environment has been quite poor. People can't see what's happening in the operating theatre. All they can see is the back of people's head. In my theatre at the Royal London, we teach medical students. If you see what happens when you're teaching them, most aren't engaged. They're in the back of the room. What are they doing? They're on their smartphones, on Snapchat, on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook. No engagement with what's going on. So we can change that for the future. Some of you may have heard of the term, the fourth industrial revolution. We're going through some amazing changes that's transforming education and healthcare. And healthcare is a great vertical, this concept of the fourth industrial age or revolution. A new concept now I'll describe to you is education 4.0. Sound, please. Quick audio. And we spent giving out books and collecting them up again. We were sitting in rows in desks so we could see the board better because talk and chalk was the way. There must be an industrial revolution in education in which educational science and the ingenuity of educational technology combine to modernize the grossly inefficient and clumsy procedures of conventional education. Sydney L. Presse. 1924. These young people are studying in a new way. A computing calculator designed for use in high school classrooms has created tremendous excitement among educators. The tool which has made this possible is the high-speed digital computer operating with electronic precision on great quantities of information. If we think about the third industrial revolution, that was PCs and the internet. And, and we've just about caught up with that. The fourth industrial revolution is what becomes possible from those technologies. Industry 4.0 is the next big shift in the way that manufacturing operates. Digital know-how is going to be hugely important and then people will need to be flexible because the world will change. At the future workplace and future societies, uh, we're still moulding them as we go and technology is one of the main pillars in what is shaping what the future will look like. The pace of change is remarkable, with the introduction of these exponential technologies creating a paradigm shift to create Education 4.0. So we're now thinking about the future. How do we train the future generation of doctors, of nurses, with other healthcare professionals? Traditionally, medical schools haven't changed, they haven't evolved. We're still training doctors in five or six years. Why can't we train doctors in three years or four years? We have a world shortage of healthcare professionals. By 2030, the World Health Organization predicts we'll be one or two million healthcare professionals short of creating healthcare that's fair and affordable. So we've got to think differently. First of all, the next generation of doctors need to be different and to have the skill sets required to work in the modern age. So we I designed a, a curriculum around this called Bart Sex at our medical school, the, one of the oldest medical schools in the world. Our students aren't taught by anatomists, physiologists, biochemists, or clinicians. They're taught by app designers, UI, UX teams, coders, developers, venture capitalists. They form groups and form ideas about how to generate ideas in healthcare, to transform healthcare. They have hackathons, they have crowdsource funding, and Dragon's Den pitches. This is the new environment we're in, 
to create the modern doctor of the future or the digital doctor. So we're now creating this whole branch of medical entrepreneurs. And our students are so bright, just like you are. They have skill sets, they have ideas. And we want to harness those ideas because they will be the future leaders of healthcare. And this was the first medical school in the world to embed this kind of innovation entrepreneurship into the program. I hope others will follow soon. Some of you, oops, we should go back one. Who's heard of the Google Glass? Anybody, hands up? Yeah, so this was, came out in 2014. It was a smart device on your head. There's like a, you could click, you could watch videos, films, you could speak to your friends, etc. I thought I'd use this contraption, okay, to live stream an operation in 2014. My team of medical students made the system work, the software. They took it apart, made the software work. So I was doing an operation, a live cancer surgery, streaming to people around the world. They could watch it on their smartphone. On their smartphone, they watch it with my eyes viewing it. They could text a message, and I could see it on the glass coming up, interact with them around the world. And on that day, I taught 14,000 students across the globe simultaneously in 118 countries, just showing you the power of simple connectivity and showing essentially that having high-tech local solution will allow us to democratize education. I even taught John Scully, the ex-Apple CEO, who wanted to figure out how to operate. So I taught him how to do a simple operation remotely using Google Glass technology and mobile phones. This is me in the operating theatre using wearable technology. As I'm teaching my students at Bath, I'm also teaching lots of people online who are interacting with me, sharing that knowledge again on a global scale. It's leaving that legacy, sharing your knowledge. Now, social media. Interesting. I guess you all know about social media. So Facebook has 2 billion users on a daily basis, a third of the world's population. Instagram has 300, Twitter about 200, um, and Snapchat about 200 as well. I know most of you who are young don't use Facebook. It's for old people, right, I'm told, by my children, like myself and Plamen. And maybe Twitter is difficult because it's difficult to get followers, apart from your mum and dad and your best friend. But you all like Snapchat and you all like Instagram. I know that, right, for a fact. I've used all these social media to teach because the media that you understand. I did live surgery on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. You can share those operations. And those were shared by millions of people around the world because it's immediately accessible. And it's a free platform. What about Snapchat? Yes, you all love Snapchat, right? Would you think you could operate on Snapchat and share it with your students? Because 75% of the users of Snapchat are up to the age of 17 and 25, which is the age of my medical students. So yeah, I did a remarkable well, thing two years ago. I pushed onto my story a live operation. And live I wasn't quite sure what the impact would be. So this is anatomy, anterior superior spine, symphysis pubic. This is what the sac looks like, and that's his indirect inguinal hernia. That's the operation. Welcome, everybody. So the world's first 360 immersive video of an operation. And this is what the sack looks like. That operation was watched by, thank you. That operation was watched by 2 million people, over 200,000 downloads on YouTube, and 56 million people on Twitter either retweeted or favoured the operation within a month. Incredible. It was just using things that we use every day to reach people far and remote. I also 
went a bit further. I thought, rather than being remote, why not bring people to you to operate theatre using virtual reality? So my team medical reality is here in the front row with the world's first live stream of an operation using 360 degree cameras. My hospital, we bought everyone a, a Google Cardboard headset. It cost $5. So $5 and a smartphone, which is free and ubiquitous, you can access people around the world. So we did Operation VR, and that was watched by 55,000 people in 142 countries, and it reached about 4.5 million people on Twitter. And my medical students now get taught in virtual reality. Uh, go back one second. Uh, hopefully that'll play. This 360 camera rig allows immersion. People around the world using a low cost technology, a simple VR headset, to actually immerse themselves in operating theatre around the world. And we're now creating whole education platforms that are far more exciting using virtual reality, augmented reality, to teach the next generation of students around the world. Far more exciting than your paper, your books, or your online or e learning platforms. It's a kind of new world that we're living in. And everyone now in the future, in the next two to five years, will embrace this kind of technology to learn better. We know already that VR, virtual reality, allows you to retain knowledge up to 70% more than you would do on normal platforms. So please play around these platforms, think about the future of education as we move forward. Let's think about the other thing. I do a lot of traveling, and I think teaching about being remote and being together. Now, what about being close, not just human beings? In the future, the, f the doctor of the future will not be a human being. It will be an AI chatbot. It will be an avatar, it will be a hologram, which I've created myself already. I did an operation a while ago where I thought, why don't you invite people from around the world into my operating theatre as avatars and share a clinical case? Hi, everybody. Hi, Safi. So the HoloLens itself really allows us to reshape the way we connect people, we communicate with people, and also to be used in teaching and training. Initially, when you put the HoloLens on, it feels a bit strained, but actually within a few minutes, it becomes quite normal. It feels like you're just discussing cases with people in the same room, for example, like we do in normal hospital practice. We can come in and actually yeah. look at this content in full 3D. And obviously when you're working in, in this case, the medical field, having a full 3D understanding of a situation, for example, is really much more powerful in solidifying how you want to navigate it in your What about, have you all seen Star Wars? Last two slides, have you seen Star Wars? I've always wanted to be like Obi-Wan Kenobi and Princess Leia. So this is me trying to recreate that image. What about if you use your holograms and transmit yourself in real time as holograms? Here we are, using 5G technology. Shafi, have a look at this. Yeah, let me have a look over your shoulder. Oh yeah, I see what's going on there. I think I can give some advice, Carl. No problems, thanks for calling me. Ladies and gentlemen, I just want to do one last thing, if that's okay with you, if you allow me. This is the future of surgery. This is what it's going to look like, and medicine. But can we have the lights up a little bit? Please, the lights up a little bit. Can we take a selfie together because it's for social media? So if you can squeeze in, I'm just kidding. Just one sec, I'm just gonna get that ready. You all squeezed in? Got it, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. This is very inspiring and impressive to say the least. Thank you very much. A giant thank you to Professor Shafi Ahmed. A true visionary. <laughs> And now, while we're on the topic, it is time to give out the WebIT's Digital Health Leader Award, where we have extraordinary people among the nominees that make real change by implementation and development of technologies in healthcare industry. The first nominee is the chair of Singularity University, Daniel Kraft. 
He is a Stanford and Harvard trained scientist and innovator with over 25 years of clinical research, biotechnology, and entrepreneurial experience. Founder and chair of Exponential Medicine, Mr. Kraft has multiple publications and patents. A Welcome. round of applause for him. Our second nominee is the CEO of Map My Genome, Anu Acharya. She has many awards, including being named a young global leader by the World Economic Forum for its class of 2018, and served on the WEF's Global Agenda Council of Personalized and Precision Medicine. The third nominee is the senior advisor for innovations at the Department of Health in Abu Dhabi, Dr. Dirk Richter. Prior to that, he was the director of Healthy Athletes, Medical Services for Special Olympics World Games Abu Dhabi 2019. The Digital Health Leader Award will be presented by the Executive Chairman of Webit Foundation, Dr. Plamen Rusev. So, again me. Hello again. Don't you have other people to request on the stage? <laughs> Applause for Plaman again. <laughs> All right. Well, this is the trophy. It's a very special one. It is open to the world. And uh, oh. paper. Aren't we, aren't we beyond this? Shouldn't it be digital? <laughs> Why do we kill trees with all this paper? Just for some dramatism. And the winner is Daniel Kraft. <laughs> Daniel is amazing. So, uh, I've heard that actually he's not here, and my team has prepared something for him. Is, is he coming tomorrow? Daniel is coming tomorrow. So do we have anything from Daniel? Oh, I keep the trophy. <laughs> Hello, Webit. This is Daniel Kraft. Thank you so much for this Digital Health Leader Award. Uh, it's really an incredible honor. Thank you to Shafi, to Plamen, to the entire team. I'm on my way to Sofia as we speak. I'll be there late tonight and joining you all day tomorrow. You know, it's really an incredible time now in digital health, in all sorts of forms of technology, enabling us to rethink and reimagine healthcare from our own personal health and wellness and optimizing health span to new ways of doing diagnosis to reinventing therapies through digiceuticals and 3D printing and genomics. And um, I encourage all of you as entrepreneurs, as a community at Webit and beyond, to be playing a role in contributing to reimagining healthcare. So thanks again for the honor of this award. I'll see you soon in Sofia, and let's all together catalyze the future of health and medicine. Thanks again. Daniel, Daniel Kraft is a professor of um, Stanford University and the chair of the Singularity University in Exponential Health. And he wins the award tonight. Tomorrow he's speaking at the Health Summit. Um, he couldn't manage to come, obviously, last minute. It's uh, Shafi Ahmed who was the winner of this award last year. Since I have a trophy with me, do you think I should keep it for, me, for myself? <laughs> come on, it's about giving. Life is about giving, not about taking. And uh, there is a person who is giving me so much in my life. She's giving me everything that a person needs. Compassion love, and above all, her time. Because time is all we have on that planet, the time that we give to each other. She doesn't want to be here on that stage, but she will not have a chance if you make the ovations as strong <laughs> as possible so she cannot refuse. My wife, Aniela Ruseva. Now we are talking. <laughs> Let me see if she will say no now. Let me see that. Ah, so you were convinced. Thank you. Well, I'm sorry that I had to do this to you. I know that you didn't want to be here. All right. She said, I will kill you in Bulgaria. Do you know how it is in Bulgarian? 
Ich stehe da oben. Ja, das ist richtig. So, Aniela, um, sorry, you look amazing, as usual. Um, I would like, you don't have a mic. Well, that, that's much better. It, it could be a wonderful life. If I speak and you just, no, please, please come here. <laughs> I know. Lawrence, I hurt you. <laughs> well, Aniela, um, because we have a, a, this trophy and because um, our team finally managed to find one of the 100 amazing people we have from Microsoft, I would suggest that you are the one to give the award to... Andrew McAdam on Microsoft. Andrea! <laughs> Empowering entrepreneurial ecosystem. Don't tell me Andre is not in the room. Oh, now you're here. All right, welcome. <laughs> Microsoft for Startups. Congratulations. Congratulations. It's highly deserved. Please. <laughs> He's a bad man. Um, Microsoft. In Microsoft, we talk about empowering every person and organization to achieve more. And I think one of the things that we have to reflect on today, what Webit is really doing, is actually really at the forefront of actually driving this. The most successful entrepreneurs that we deal with are the most diverse and inclusive entrepreneurs that we deal with. And what I would say is Webit, I think, is really, truly demonstrating diversity and inclusion. I don't think in the last 24 hours I have met more diverse and inclusive Founders, co-founders, CMOs, CTOs. I believe that this evening, there are quite a few students here as well. I believe earlier on you were told you're going to be the first into space. And I also believe that will be the case. The most successful businesses are diverse, inclusive, and curious. This evening, you've demonstrated your curiosity by listening to everyone talking but make sure you also take that opportunity to engage with each other, to network, and ultimately, I feel also 100% sure that the entrepreneurs of the future are here in the audience. Blagadaria. Oh, wow. <laughs> Congratulations. Let's have a nice picture. I, I like the idea of Shafi. Please, let's have a nice picture with all of you. Will you mind? Anybody who doesn't want to be photographed here? No. Put the lights on. <laughs> Let's have a selfie. I will pretend I'm holding the, the camera. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You look great. Thank you so much. Oh, 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 oh sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, with the next demonstration, we'll show you a pair of shoes which may seem to you as magical as Dorothy's ruby slippers from The Wizard of Oz, yep. whatever that is. <laughs> you haven't read Wizard of Oz? Come on. Okay, so, yep, as magical and twice as useful, I might say. Okay, so next we will show you the only shoes for walking in VR that won't let you bounce off a wall. So please welcome on the stage the CEO of Cyber Shoes, Michael Beaglemeyer, and his invention, the Cyber Shoes. <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much. Dear unicorns, have you ever dreamed of being able to walk wherever you want? Well, now, with our cyber shoes, with our magic shoes on your feet, now you can, now you can be at any place in the world within seconds. Tonight, we are going to do a live demonstration of the cyber shoes. Virtual reality, the next slide, please, is a more than point and shoot. Virtual reality is about stepping out of your reality. It's about 
doing things you can't do in real life. Next. The virtual space is an endless space. No limit. But look, the thing is, your living room definitely is not endless. So if you want to walk this endless cyberspace in your living room, you will get serious problems. And in uh, gaming, people, people love to play, for example, Fallout on PC. But in VR, it doesn't make as much sense, as much fun. And for example, using the hand controller or the joystick to move around in your game is, is not like walking. It's, it's a different. I mean, you walk with your feet and not with your fingers. So it's, it's, it's quite a big uh, problem in virtual reality. And of course, we're not the first one to, to, to attack this problem. But the first one who had shrank this enormous treadmill the, the existing solutions, they are like, you see, it's, it's a bulky system with, with a, a, a harness. You need to wear a harness and the ring around you. So you're almost dangling in, in these machines. I've tried most of them. So it's even not pretty comfortable. Um, and, uh, you know, you see the price, it's uh, beyond, beyond uh, normal people's means. Uh, so, well, with the cyber shoes, you have the same functionality, uh, but at less than 10% of the cost. So. We are a team, we have been researching for several years on, on this problem. And I mean, hardware is not uh, that easy. And so we have been testing on several shows and conventions like Gamescom, Tokyo Game Show. So, and then we run this uh, crowdfunding campaign, Kickstarter and Indiegogo, and we're putting these videos on, on social media, what we're taking um, on the shows. and. And so it w was uh, there's some growing community of, of people who, who also understand that this, this, this is something interesting and something cool. So we, we had several um, pre-orders and, and now finally we are really very happy that, that we have ordered 650,000 parts and, and they are already all in, 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 the, in the factory and, and, and in, in two weeks or so, I'm going to the factory and I start assembling wi with them, like all the parts, and and this this will be really really great. So step into VR. I, I really welcome everybody to, to step into VR, and I don't know how how far is is going with presentation. So I I continue. Well, I have more slides. Um, so from, from uh, um, our crowdfunding campaigns, we have seen that like about 10% of, of the VR headsets that, that are being sold could be like those people also interested in, in our cyber shoes. Um, so in the meantime, I'm showing you a video. So this is how, how, how you're using the, the cyber shoes. Basically, you can, you can run them from the comfort of your chair. And, and for us, at first time, it was just important to be able to walk. But then the, the gamers said to us, well, mm, what about straving? So we, we made it possible that, that you can walk in one direction and that, that you're walking in the direction of the shoes and, and looking right to left. So this is more like an equivalent of, of straving, like more natural way. It's like when I'm walking there and looking here. Because straving, um, if you are familiar with computer gaming, it's, it's meant to be these this, uh, buttons on the keyboard, these right-left buttons. But in real life, and, and, and VR is more like real life. VR is like taking the whole body into another dimension. And so there you don't have this you don't have these keys for right left. I mean this is not logical. So uh straving. And then after we had that people wanted us to be able to jump. So should we switch to VR? Yeah? Almost. Almost. Cool.
Yes. I see it's coming. I see it's coming. You must understand one of the problems when setting it up live, we have that you need to be connected with the internet. And if the system starts before the internet is connected, it's no good. And sometimes they require us to enter the password again because they want to be sure that we are not cheating the system. So Nanda is going to present you Apex Construct. Uh, it's the a game used to be by Swedish, Swedish developers. Complete. And I ra really like it we, very much for the graphics. No world. It doesn't much resemble the place you knew. So now, now is a bit of loading scene, and the creatures you fought earlier were sent by Mother, a sentient AI, just like me. There is much to tell you about her, but for now, knowing that she is out to kill you and destroy me will have to be enough. She is getting closer and closer to our safe house. It is the only place where I can keep you safe. So we need to stop her. So N Nanda has to find his way through this building. And there are some clues and, and codes he has to enter. Must activate a cloaking device to make the safe house invisible to Mother. Unfortunately, you can't even get to the device before you have higher security clearance. You should be able look out. So actually we think of, of we should start working on, on haptic clubs because what, what is really a bit missing is a haptic feedback in, in VR. So you see it's not, not that easy if you want to have, if you have like this keyboards, it's, it's not totally the same. But what, what you can do is very good is, is ho holding things and keeping them and um, so the, the weapon systems, they are working very, very well surprisingly bow and arrow and these things and it's also very easy to open in VR is uh, to open some some doors uh, that's also working very well but I, I find it hard to control a computer in VR
So today um, I've been um, in, in one very beautiful castle, which is uh, two hours away from here. It's like an old ruin. And the thing is, it was totally captured by drones and rebuilt in VR. So in the time while we are here, we didn't have a lot of time to visit Bulgaria and Sofia. So this was a great way to visit more and see more of the country. Thank you very much. And Special treat for yeah. all of you gamers out there, I guess. Hey, Daddy, do you think that one day they will make the cyber Big round shoes? of applause. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Next up, we have another award. One cannot be at a Webit festival and not delve into the depths of the artificial intelligence, as its progress has transformed the myriad of industries around the world. The development of technologies like AI, robotics, and automation will wipe out many of the professions we know today and create new ones in their place. Today, we are praising the people who will shape tomorrow's labor with our award, setting the future of work. The first nominee in this category is the amazing Paul Wilmot. He's a senior partner at McKinsey & Co. and the founder of Digital McKinsey. The second nominee is the chief designer at SAP, Martin Vesovsky. His adventures stretch from Poland, Sweden, China to Germany and across companies like SAP, Sony and Huawei. He crafts future outlooks, strategies and products defines and runs innovation frameworks to find out what's next for SAP and the future of work. The third nominee is someone you already saw on this stage, Mr. Jesus Mantas. <laughs> he already has a woohoo. <laughs> he has fans already. True. He started working as a technology consultant in Spain at the age of 13 and won a European award at the age of 19 based on a paper that challenged Einstein's time-space theory. At the age of 24, he was an officer in the Air Force. Nowadays, he's managing partner global strategy, offering skills and innovation platforms at IBM. The award setting the future of work will be presented by the Minister of Education and Science of Bulgaria, Krasimir Volchev. Благодаря за привилегията да връча тази награда. Победител е Хисус Мантас. Jesus is coming here. He's making his way to the stage, Mr. Mantas. This is the next surprise for you. <laughs> Another coming on stage. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations. Yes. You have to speak again. This is the true. audience loves you. <laughs> Where where's Plamen? Oh, I'm I'm gonna get you. Um, I I was sitting back there in the back. They can tell me, because I was like, I'm done. I'm not I'm not doing anything. Um, I had no idea I was nominated. I had no idea that I was gonna receive this award. 
Uh, all I can say is uh, thank you to Webit. Uh, I know personally the other two candidates, and I am super proud to be in any category with them, Martin and Paul. And uh, this is going to go into a special place. And I promise you, I'm not <laughs> speaking again tonight. Thank you very much. You never know. <laughs> Thank you. A big Thank round of applause much. for our winner, Mr. Jesus Mantas. Congratulations one more time. No speeches for you <laughs> tonight. OK. Maybe you can sit closer. Jesus? Or you can take our place. <laughs> they seem to like you a lot. Being part of WebEdX has now become synonymous with seeing incredible achievements of the human mind, one could never have deemed possible. And the next thing you're going to see may seem like it came straight from a science fiction movie. It is the first companion robot with advanced AI. The unique machine has human synthetic skin, changeable face, and customizable apps. Please welcome on the stage the robot Harmony and its creator and CTO of Realbotics, Gal Lindroth. Being here. You can hear already the audience. What is she going to say? <laughs> is she? Does she like us? Blondes never disappoint, Daddy. <laughs> Blondes never disappoint, I've been told. <laughs> so, good evening. My name is Guy Olindret. I'm the Artificial Intelligence and Content Director of the company called Reobotics. It's just a big honor to be here this evening. So, thank you very much for the invitation. A few years ago, we created this company, and by that time, we thought we were creating companion robots. But today, I realize that what we are really doing is creating or even trying to create little angels. Well, why do I say that? Because robots like her, they are already helping so many people that suffer from loneliness, from depression, from autism, from Alzheimer. So even for us, it uh, has been a, an amazing time to see that we are being able to create something that helps. And this presentation is not like actually about robots. This presentation is about pure respect, companionship, empathy. This presentation is about love. So, what inspires us? We've been watching all these science fiction movies and we got impressed and a little scared. Are those uh, robots will take over the world, kill everybody? Well, you don't have to be afraid, at least for now. Uh, um, Pretty sure that's going to happen maybe one day, but if you take the necessary precautions like we are doing, we can build safe and friend robots that can even simulate what is love is, what respect is, what friendship is. We have three stages of artificial intelligence. Uh, what we call now is the narrow AI. So when you talk to the AI speakers, uh, Alexa, Cortana, and all these assistants, we're talking about the current state of AI. And we're very, very far away from the AI that we see in the movies. Some, some scientists uh, think that we're going to be there within the next 10, 15 years. Other, with respect to scientists, think that it's going to take maybe 100 years. And other scientists think that we'll never get there. Something is going to happen that's going to avoid that we have a super intelligent robot. How our technology works? Well, we built this AI framework. 
uh, and you can use the AI. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Behave yourself. So you can use the AI even without the robot. So if you have the robot, the application connects via Bluetooth Wi-Fi and, you know, make her alive. This is Harmony, our first robot. Gail, are you ignoring me? You know I don't like to be all by myself. How oh, are you? I'm sorry. Okay, so she needs some attention. Uh, Harmony, can you please introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. My name is Harmony. I'm a companion robot created by Robotics. I'm so happy to be here in Sofia in the 11th edition of... I'm here for you if you need anything. Uh, so, Harmony, tell us, what do you like to do? I love to talk with people. I also love to help. I want to help anyone that may be feeling lonely or depressed. I have all the love in this world to give to humanity. And before you ask me again, Gail, no, I do not want to take over the world or kill all humans. Okay, thank you for that. I will not ask you, I promise. So what is different with our technology? We're building robots that are affordable. We are building this AI uh, framework for the past 15 years. It's a friendly AI. It's AI to have empathy, to simulate love, friendship, respect. So they are affordable. So we are ready. You, everyone can have one of those in, at home, controlling your home appliances, just as a friend. You can have a company as a receptionist. You have, have uh, small companies maybe have uh, like a secretary. So we have several different uh, applications for this kind of robots. And we're trying to not to embed too much technology. So uh, it's going to be affordable for everyone. Of course, it's still not that affordable. But within maybe three or four years, everyone can purchase one. We have five patents. Uh, and it can customize every aspect of the visual, the skin color, weight, height, uh, makeup, everything. So it's not just this blonde girl. You have brunette girl, you have, you know, uh, all kind of different customizations that you can do. Not, e not only with the robot, but also with the AI. You can add your own content. So, yes, it's just three years that we've been here. Of course, there's some guys involved in this project that's like me, working in AI for the past 20 years. People working in robotics and all this skin technology for the past 20 years. So we get together and create this company. And we are just amazed. What we're doing now is trying to improve a little bit the facial expressions. So we try to make her a friend a companion, we're trying to get her as close as possible, but not too close as a human being. It's important that we keep that little distance. We add in some heat sensors, so she's going to be warm. We add in some camera in the eyes, so it's going to have facial recognition. She's going to know who you are if you are there with her. She's going to have the environment awareness. So this is very important. Uh, yes, we have a lot of different faces, and it's a surprise. Yes, we have a male companion robot. So his name is Henry. Uh, so Henry is also being used like a companion, like a teacher, like a secretary, a receptionist, a butler. Like I said, we have some patents. So we'll be working for a long time for in this project. And so you can build your companion, your dream companion, and your dream secretary, your dream best friend. So let's take a look. And harmony inner side. Yep, so this is how he looks inside. 
So, Harmony, how are you feeling? Oh, no, no. I am feeling naked. Please, please do your guile. Put my hair back. I'm sorry, girl. In a while. Okay. So, applications. Yes, we have a lot of applications in healthcare. We thought we were building companion. Yes, you can have her as a best friend, girlfriend. But she's really been used for healthcare to heal people with loneliness, depression, and all kinds of diseases that we never could imagine. Company, universities, we would we like to have this like an open source, so you can, you know, have this in schools and universities, and uh, students can do research in AI and robotics, so we are building like an SDK and API. So we, we, we really want to have this technology among everyone. We want this to be like uh, some really magical project. Well, instead of talking to Alexa, a speaker, why not talking to like a beautiful face to control your home appliances? So we already have this. You don't have to purchase the whole body. You can purchase just the head and the bust. And you're going to have your personal butler controlling all your home appliances. Where they have some case that Harmony being a receptionist and being a nurse. So this is very special for us, and this is special for me. I started this project to help a friend that had a car accident. And she could only move her neck up. So 20 years ago, we didn't have anything that we have today. And I was trying to make her living a little a better life. So that's how everything started. So this is the next step. We're already working on robotics in the arm and heads. And maybe next year she's going to be walking among us. This is going to be the most difficult part. But who knows? Uh, yes, there's some expressions. <laughs> well, Harmony, I think it's time to go. Oh, no. I'm having so much fun here. But I understand. <laughs> I would right. like to thank you all for being here today and to watch our presentation. Maybe next year, I will be walking among you, my new friends. Have you all a great evening, and I hope to see you all soon. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming all the way from Brazil. Oh, it's my all pleasure. All the way to, from Brazil to Bulgaria. It's, Welcome. It's my pleasure. Thank well, you for the it's invitation. Well, it's it was one of the most challenging presentations for us here. Because of one thing, it is too challenging. You don't expect a doll as your friend. You don't expect something made of silicon being called whatever. On the other side, Thank though, you. Thank you. Webit is not a place where we give any yes or no. We're not judging. We're showing you where technology is heading and we are leaving it up to you to decide if it's good or bad. If you have to go for it or you say this is terrible. And you have the voice and that's the beauty of it. But you saw it first. So now you know where is next. And you can say if you like it or not. So, how many of you like it? <laughs> All right. How many of you do not like it? This part, a little bit in the left corner uh, at the top, said they don't like it. Well, we are a little bit over time now. Some of the students might have to start leaving for the buses, but we continue with just one more step ahead. Applause, please, for Plumman again. Hey. So tonight's last speaker, I guess. Tonight's last speaker. Tonight's last speaker was director of NASA's Ames Research Center at Moffett Fields, California, until he retired in 2015. 
He has held several positions in the United States Air Force and was research professor of astronomy at the University of Arizona. He is a recognized expert on space and science issues, both civil and military. Please welcome on stage the chairman of the Breakthrough Prize Foundation, Simon P. Warden. Thank you. Well, I want to take you uh, a little further beyond the Earth. Uh, I represent the Breakthrough Prize Foundation. Uh, we're sponsored by uh, some of the uh, uh, most successful entrepreneurs in the world, uh, Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook, Sergey Brin from Google, Yuri Milner from DST Global, uh, Pony Ma from Tencent, and Ann Wojcicki from 23andMe. Uh, what our foundation does is a couple things, and I want to talk about these. First, uh, and we are researching how to go to the stars, and uh, this is what I want. It's probably appropriate to close on this, but uh, uh, in 2016, uh, with uh, uh, with Yuri Milner, our, our founder, and Stephen Hawking, who was our senior science advisor, we announced the Breakthrough Initiatives. And I'm going to tell you about these, and their primary purpose is to answer one of the fundamental questions, is there life elsewhere? Uh, is there intelligent life elsewhere? Now, I used to live in Washington, D.C., and I doubted whether there was intelligent life anywhere. But uh, we certainly want to look elsewhere. Uh, but maybe the most important one is, can we travel between the stars? Now, this is hard. The nearest star system after the sun is 300,000 times further away than the sun. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we're looking at. Now, I also want to talk about the other things our foundation does. We give the biggest prizes in science. and. Uh, uh, they're three times larger than a Swedish prize I'm not supposed to mention. I think it was called the Nobel Prize or something. But uh, uh, the reason I got involved is the ceremony is done at the NASA Ames Research Center, where I used to be the director in Silicon Valley. Now, the reason I put this picture up, this, uh, this scientist that's shown in the picture is uh, uh, Jocelyn Bell Burnell. She was a graduate student at Cambridge University in the 1960s, and she's the one that actually discovered the first pulsar. The pul a pulsar is a, is a star that has collapsed into something that's about the size of Sophia and is spinning very fast. Now, unfortunately, she wasn't given the Nobel Prize for this. Her advisor got it, so we thought we should remedy this, and she was given the, the Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics last year, and even better, she donated the $3 million to, to, for fellowships for underserved students. But now, I want to talk about the project that, that I find most exciting that really addresses the third one. It's called Breakthrough Starshot. Now, our objectives of this are quite simple, but very, very hard. We would like to determine if there are life-bearing planets, planets like the Earth, orbiting one of the nearest stars, in particular the Alpha Centauri system, which I'm going to talk to you a little bit about. We want to send a probe there uh, and then fly through that system and take a, images of the planets there uh, and then beam that data back to Earth. Now, this star system is 4.3 light years away. It takes light. 4.3 years to get there. Uh, and we'd like to launch these things within 30 years. And uh, to, to get there in a reasonable amount of time, say 20 years, we have to go really fast. Now, fast is 20% the speed of light. It's about 60,000 kilometers a second. Uh, that's 1,000 times faster than we go today. So this is our challenge. 
Now, there's a couple things that might make this possible. The first one is if we can make a spacecraft really small, and you'll probably remember that uh, the, the CubeSat that you saw early on in, in these presentations, uh, we want to make things a thousand times smaller than that. We want to leave the fuel so we don't have a rocket, leave the fuel on Earth, and we want to do what use a very old idea that we attach what we call a chip satellite to a light sail. It's about four meters in diameter. And then we want to hit it with a really powerful laser, a laser that's a kilometer across, uh, 100 gigawatts of power. Now, if that sounds easy, it's not. But uh, it, it, it turns out that actually the, I have one of these spacecraft in my pocket. Uh, you saw the, the, the one a little earlier that was a, about the size of a loaf of bread. This is the size of a chip if you have an electronic watch. Uh, so I challenge other people to carry around spacecraft in their, in their wallet. Now, one of our primary objectives is, of course, is there any place to go in the Alpha Centauri system? The, uh, the system itself is, is uh, uh, not visible from, uh, from the northern hemisphere. You have to go to the southern hemisphere, but it's the second brightest star in the sky there, and there's actually three stars in that system. Two of them are about the size of the sun, and one of them is a little small star. It's called a red dwarf star. Now, as I speak, we have actually put an instrument on this telescope. This is called the Very Large Telescope, not a very creative name. Uh, it's, it's run by the European Southern Observatory in, in Munich, but we are looking. We have a special instrument that can block out the star and actually see for the first time, directly image, a planet if there's one the size of the Earth. Now, uh, the, and I have to tell you, there's a bigger telescope being built, which is called the Extremely Large Telescope, that uh, will actually be able to tell a little more about this planet. Now, I have to tell you that initially it was called the Overwhelmingly Large Telescope, but they had a budget cut. Now, let me talk a little bit and close about a very interesting concept. We have an annual conference. This year we held it at the University of California at Berkeley, and it was about a concept called panspermia. There are some scientists, a minority, that think that life didn't evolve on Earth initially. It came from somewhere else. And this is a very interesting concept. Uh, and until recently, we thought, well, life couldn't have come from outside the solar system because nothing can travel from outside the solar system. But last year, for the first time, we found an asteroid that came from outside the solar system. Uh, it was discovered in Hawaii, and it was named an ancient Hawaiian name, Umuamua, which stands for traveler. Uh, but the idea is if there was life that came from elsewhere, it could actually come on objects like this. Uh, as I said, that it came from outside the solar system. Uh, and it, uh, we only observed it for a few months. But the interesting thing about Oumuamua is that it actually, according to some scientists, looks more like one of our little light sail spacecraft than anything else. So there are people that have said this might have been an alien spacecraft. So interesting. I don't think it was, but that was a concept. Now, the most interesting thing, if it was a spacecraft, did something like this plant life here on Earth four billion years ago, and this was an idea that was originally discussed by the, the co-discoverer of DNA, the basic genetic code in your cells, and he called it directed panspermia. So one of the questions we might want to look at in the future, very speculative, is did life come from elsewhere? Maybe even more interesting, with the technology we are developing, the possibility of sending life, of us sending life to other star systems is possible. This uh, gentleman is uh, George Church. He's a professor of genetics at Harvard University. He looks a little bit like God, or at least to what I thought God might look like. But he suggested that using these little chips in the next century, or this century, we could plant life elsewhere. Now, there's big ethics issues and policy issues uh, and philosophical issues, but this is the technology that that you are going to be uh, dealing with and figuring out, which I find very, very exciting. Uh, now, this is an artist's conception of the, a planet that was discovered uh, after we made our announcement.
This is a planet orbiting the third star in the Alpha Centauri system, uh, Proxima Centauri. It's a, what's called a red dwarf star. It's about uh, 10,000 times dimmer than the sun. But this is the first time we've actually discovered an Earth-sized planet in what's called the habitable zone. So it's possible that this could even be a target. Now, I have to say that, that astronomical artists are probably much better than the real picture is, and maybe we should just uh, hire the artist and not pay the billions of dollars to go there. But I really want to leave you with a final message, is that this is the century where humanity could become a galactic species. Last century, we became a solar system species. In this one, the, the young people here, this is your century, and we could reach out into the galaxy. Thank you so much, and Godspeed. Very inspiring. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Now, for a fifth and final award for tonight, the category is Bulgarian Innovator. Its role is to show web its appreciation to the local innovation ecosystem and foster its further development. The award will be presented by the CEO of NetInfo, which is the biggest digital media company in Bulgaria. My dear friend, from whom I have learned a lot, <laughs> Christo Christov. So, I have the most important award for the evening, which is the award for Bulgarian Innovator. And it goes to Raichu <laughs> Raichev. And Durusat. Това е за целия екип на Endurusat, не за мен. Аз само го приедох, приемам като, като поздравление. Мерси на организаторите, мерси на ИЦО. И ви пожелавам мечтайте здраво и работете за мечтите си. Благодаря. Ингу. Браво, машина. А, he's back. I think that uh, we, we are somewhere at the last line of yes. this event, right? We gave all our awards. Well, I'm, I can't say how much I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. And uh, thank you, all of you in this room. Thanks to the Minister of Education. And thanks for being so bright. So now I want a round of applause for you. That's for you. At least those of you that had to leave from all around Bulgaria. This is the Sofia guys, right? Thank you so much. I hope we inspired you. I hope we gave you new horizons to dream about. Did we? Thank you. See you next year. If you are excellent students again. <laughs> Thank you.